Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending this presentation on the wonderful world of aphids. I appreciate everybody uh, uh, interested in attending COSI's wonderful event on um, the uh, um, <coughs> farm days. Um, it's a shame that we can do this in, in, in person, um, but nonetheless, sometimes, especially when we're looking at the role of insects, it's it's a good opportunity to show up close images and videos um, and to learn something new about the, these, these very interesting uh, insects. My name is Andy Michael. I am a professor in the Department of Entomology at The Ohio State University. I'm also in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences based on the Worcester campus where a lot of my research focuses on aphids, the importance of aphids and why we are interested in them and, and what, what important aspects they can do uh, for everyday life. So out of the over 1 million insects, why are we interested in aphids? Or at least why am I interested in aphids? And why are you all interested in aphids since you're joining this talk? Um, so aphids are some of the, I think, are some of the most interesting and exceptional and important insect species. Often we think of them as plant pests. And for the most part, most aphids are plant pests. A lot of them are invasive. Uh, aphids are some of the most invasive insects um, among uh, all insect species. Um, and they can have a rapid reproductive life cycle as well. Um, but they are also important as biological models to understand evolution, understand interactions with plants, um, and uh, understand genes and genetics. And they are an also an important food source for many of the other species, especially other insects, um, and higher trophic levels. So even though they have negative aspects as plant pests and they're invasive, they are also important insects um, for the general environment and general ecologies. So first let's start out, what is an aphid? There are many different types of aphids, as you can see here, a picture of a cabbage aphid and a picture of a soybean aphid. There are over 5,000 species of aphids that are known. And some of these contain cryptic species. So uh, aphids feed, most aphids feed on plants and some aphids that feed on a certain type of plant, they may look like a similar population that feeds on a different plant. A lot of these aphids feed on maybe one host and there's cryptic speciation. So there, or there's cryptic diversity. Aphids that feed on different host plants, different types of plants, they might be different species. So this number might even be an underestimate. However, we do look at, we do think there's about 5,000 different species of aphids. Aphids are typically very, very small. Some of you have probably seen aphids uh, and they are related to stink bugs, cicadas and lice. Um, they are very ancestral, very old uh, uh, type of insect. They have soft and squishy bodies. Uh, they're very, very uh, tiny. They don't have, they're not like a beetle that's very hard or has a hard shell. And the only times that they are kind of hard are is when they have wings. And even then, most of the hard parts are not really all that hard. So they're really known to have soft and, and squishy bodies. Aphids first evolved around 280 million years ago. Um, and here's a picture of an aphid trapped in amber. And uh, aphids evolved during this time period where there's a lot of uh, evolutionary radiation. There was a lot of uh, diversity in plants. Plants um, were really taking off in, uh, in, at this time period. And since aphids are plant feeders, it allowed, it opened up a new food source for ants. And there's a lot of uh, evolution and diversity uh, in aphid species. What's interesting in this picture is one, it's it's get caught in amber, most likely when this aphid was feeding on this on this plant or tree. And two, as you can see, this long kind of needle-like mouth part. Um, this is the aphid mouth part. This is a what's known as a proboscis. I said, like I said earlier, aphids feed on plants and they treat them almost like juice boxes. Aphids have straw-like straw -like mouth parts, what's known as a proboscis in the insect world. And this long proboscis goes around the plant cells and feeds directly on the phloem. 
Now the phloem is the part of the plant that uh, transports nutrients all across the plant, specifically sugars, um, but other nutrients as well. And this is what the aphid feeds on. Aphids are like most little kids almost, they like candy. And this might be appropriate as Halloween is coming up. Aphids feed on this sugary phloem almost exclusively. And what's interesting, again, about aphids is they take this long mouth part, this proboscis, and it is like a needle. It's like a straw. They go around all the cells and they probe and they test until they find this phloem here. And then they just suck up all that sugary phloem. Sometimes it's good to be an aphid. I wouldn't want to be an aphid dentist because there's probably a lot of cavities in there. But the aphids feed a lot on the sugary phloem. Aphids have interesting life cycles and they have a diversity of life cycles. There are very few aphid species that have the same uh, uh, life cycle. Of one, there's a lot of differences from one species to another, uh, but all of them have a very complicated life cycle. Uh, most in certain times of the year, aphids can be clonal, which means they can just reproduce themselves and make copies of themselves. They're almost like mini Xerox machines. They can make copy after copy after copy. And we'll discuss that in a little bit. But aphids can also be clonal and uh, mate as well. And they can have a very complicated life cycle. So, uh, and, and in this life cycle, as I said earlier, aphids feed almost exclusively on plants. Some aphids need multiple and different plants to complete their life cycle. Um, one example here is the soybean aphid. Um, and this is an aphid that is important to Ohio, important to soybean production. We'll talk about a little, we'll talk about that a little bit. But the soybean aphid is an example where two different species of plants are needed. And if these plants do not exist, then the soybean aphid cannot complete its life cycle. We can go into detail a little bit of the soybean aphid life cycle. So let's start in the summer here. We have a wingless female. Uh, and these wingless females are on soybean plants and they feed on every type of the plant but most likely you'll find soybean aphids on the stem and on the leaf here. Uh, during the summer, uh, these wingless females can produce uh, other aphids and they can be winged aphids here. So during the summer, you could have winged and wingless aphids. And these, wing, these winged aphids migrate, disperse all over the environment. As fall comes, this is usually August and September, right before harvest. We have different forms uh, arise on soybean plants, males and females, that then go to a different species of tree known as buckthorn. And here's a picture of buckthorn. You might see this because this is a very common invasive shrub, uh, more common in northern parts of Ohio and northern parts of the US. Uh, but it is present, especially on edges of forest habitat. And so the soybean aphid goes to buckthorn here. And here you have the winged forms and then you have a wingless female form here. After these aphids appear on buckthorn, this is again, usually in August and September, you see an overwintering egg. And these females, again, lay these eggs right along the buds, right along the twigs here. And these eggs are protected. They almost have like an antifreeze protein that protects them from very cold winters. And so in this stage, and this is probably if you're out, you know, doing some hikes and you see a buckthorn tree, look on these buds and see if you can find these green eggs. These are soybean aphid eggs. They will stay in this state until the winter, until it starts to be warm again. Usually in late March, early April, they will start to hatch. They don't hatch. As typical aphids, they hatch as yet another different type of aphid, which, no, which is known as a stem mother, or what aphid biologists call a fundatrix. These stem mothers look like very huge, well, in terms of uh, aphid proportions, they are very, very large. And their sole purpose is just to produce other aphids, live other aphids. And so these aphids grow on buckthorn and then eventually, so these are the wingless females here on, on buckthorn, eventually you'll have the winged females that again go to soybean in the summer and starts the life cycle all over again. So you can see it's a very complicated life cycle with very different 
uh, forms. There's wing forms. There's wingless forms. There's form that only oh, forms that only lay eggs. There's forms that only lay live nymphs. It's a very very complicated life cycle. So uh, let me stop here and see if there are any questions about aphids so far. I'm not seeing any in the chat, but if there are any questions, feel free to include those in the chat and they will get relayed to me and we can, how large are the aphids? So we can talk about how large. There's a very uh, diff difference in sizes. Most aphids are probably less than five millimeters. Some can be maybe as big as one centimeter, probably not. Um, but some are very, very tiny, and it also depends on the life stage. This is a good picture here to show and to illustrate the different sizes of aphids, where you can see the adult, um, which is probably no more than maybe four or five millimeters. That's probably as big as an aphid. But here you have um, here you have a very young um, baby or nymph is what we call, it's probably what, maybe a third or a quarter of the size. So aphids could be very, very small, um, but no more than probably five millimeters. So another question is, how do aphids clone themselves? We will get to that in a few bit, That's a, in a few minutes. That's a very excellent question. It's a very interesting aspect about aphids because it's interesting. There's probably only Maybe they're one of the few insects that can clone themselves, um, but that's one of the characteristics that makes them um, so much of a serious pest. Okay, well, let's continue. Again, if there's questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat. So let's talk about cloning. And I like this picture because from a plant, one, my son is a huge Star Wars fan. Actually, both my sons are huge Star Wars fans. Um, but two, from a plant perspective, this is probably what happens. They get attacked by these clones, these aphid clones. Uh, aphids clone themselves and they give live birth. And an adult aphid can uh, produce about three to four uh, aphid babies, or like I said, what we call them nymphs a day. So you can imagine in an aphid living about uh, an adult aphid living about a week and it can produce three to four nymphs per day, the populations can increase quite rapidly. The, these are the aphid nymphs and it takes them about six, sometimes seven days to appear to the adult stage. And once they're in adult stage, again, they can grow, the populations can grow really, really rapidly. Aphids have what's known as telescoping generations. And this is a very interesting aspect of aphids. This is an aphid female. And I should say that in this stage, these are all uh, female aphids. The only time males are uh, available in the aphid world is when they need to go to their overwintering host. So all of these are females. And here's a female aphid. And here is how the aphids produce uh, the adult female aphid has the clones, um, and it's through a process, a typical cellular process. But what's interesting here and why it's known as telescoping generations, here is the next generation of aphid, aphid nymphs about to be born. And here you can see that they are also growing and developing the embryos that will be aphids. So in the an adult female aphid will have almost two generations inside of itself. And that's how they can grow really, really rapidly. Uh, so they have a grandmother, mother, and a daughter all together in one organism. It's really fantastic evolution um, and to really, uh, uh, um, really rapidly increase their uh, an evolutionary adaptation. So here's a video, we hope that this works, of, of an aphid giving live birth. I believe these are um, P aphids. And P aphids is a very common uh, aphid. Um, and you can see here, we have a bunch of aphids. Here are the aphid nymphs. And an aphid is giving live birth to its daughter. But these are genetically identical. These are complete clones. And so it's it's reproduction without any um, cell di cell division or, or recombination. Make sure these are accurate in in pure clones. 
And this is a time lapse video, but it, you can see it's really, really fast. You can see other aphids doing the same thing, producing live nymphs. So, again, one of the more interesting things is aphids cloning themselves and producing live birth. So, almost like an aphid, you can, it's almost like one of those jelly beans in a jar. How many aphids are in an aphid? It's very, very hard to tell. But one of the things I like about this picture is you can see here the eye spots of these developing aphids. Here you can almost make out an aphid nymph inside this adult aphid. So they're very, very interesting and very, very exciting. Um, I'd like to give a jar of jelly beans. Maybe at the next farm days we can uh, do this live in person and guess the right number of aphids. So this rapid reproduction in aphids um, causes aphidopolis or these aphid megacities where we see this exponential increase this rapid increase in aphid populations like i said one adult aphid can produce six or seven uh, uh or three to four nymphs a day times seven days you get 21 aphids and then all those can produce aphids so it can grow really really rapidly and all these aphids do is they sit and they drink the phloem and make little aphids. And that's all they do. Here's an example of an oleander aphid. Here's an example of a sugarcane aphid. Oh, this looks maybe like a corn plant because they can go on corn too. And all of these is just one little aphid, a, a, you know, a huge populations. Corn leaf aphid and here's ragwort aphids. Most of these are probably clones too um, because they're so closely knit together. And as you could see from that video, a nymph is, a nymph is born and all the nymph, nymph does is find a place to feed. And then it starts to feed and it develops and then it makes more aphids. This leads to, this can lead to overcrowding and starved plants. And this is where you can get uh, a lot of yield loss and, and, and a lot of injury from a plant perspective. If you have many, many aphids, one aphid is not gonna harm a plant, but as we've seen, one aphid can quickly turn into thousands of aphids uh, in a matter of weeks. So as this overcrowding occurs, and in some aspects, aphids are, are almost like humans like this, it, the overcrowding can uh, initiate or sprout a change in aphids to, to make wings. Um, and so here you can see an example of a soybean aphid where you have some adults, you have some nymphs, but here you have some winged forms. Um, here's a pea aphid here where you have the wingless in the winged forms. And here's an example of a banana aphid wingless in winged forms. So when crowded, and there's other signals, but typically when, when it's crowded, that is a cue or signal for the adult female aphid to add or to, to, to cause uh, the, the daughters that are developing as they grow to grow wings. So that imprint, that signal is laid by the mother uh, onto that before that nymph is born. It's very, very interesting adaptation here. What's also interesting is that these are genetically, genetically identical. These are clones. They're like identical twins. They have the same identical genes and genome, but as you can see, they look very, very different. The same thing with these aphids. The only difference genetically between this aphid and this aphid is that certain genes are turned on and certain genes are turned off, and that's how you can get winged forms. So you can have the same genes, but yet very, very different forms only because uh, only because of which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And that process is very interesting to scientists. If we can have a better understanding of which genes are turned on and turned off, then we can merely look at uh, the, the clues and how genetics informs the shapes of all animals. So this is very, very interesting. So another interesting uh, is, uh, another interesting aspect of aphids is that they have what's known as honeydew, they excrete uh, honeydew. Um, and so you can see here, here's an adult aphid, and as it's feeding, it's drinking that juice from the plant, it has to excrete, and it leaves these little droplets here. And sometimes these can get, and heavy populations get on plants, and the, the moisture here can also lead to what's known as, as sooty mold. And it's, this, it, it's mold that grows on the sticky substance of honeydew. This uh, sticky substance known as honeydew, because it is very, very sweet, because again, they're, um, 
the feeding from the sugary part of the plant. Sometimes it can be bad uh, for uh, cars and other things. As you can see, this is a, um, a car parked under a poplar tree. There's a poplar aphid, and it must have been a huge population. And all it did was just drop, drop these liquid on this car. And this is very, very sweet. A lot of car washes is probably not going to take all of this honeydew off, off this car. Um, so it's very, very, uh, it could be very, very uh, 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 bad for cars, and it could also be bad for plants. This is an example of a sugarcane aphid, uh, and this aphid actually appears to be on sorghum plants. And you can see here these huge aphid populations. And as we know, sorghum and most plants, typically the leaves are green, but in this case, they are brown because the aphid population was so high that the honeydew was excreted and that moisture got on the plant and it ended up growing all the sooty mold, which again is another aspect that can injure the plants. Another aspect of this is that if a leaf isn't green um, or if the leaf surface is blocked by that honeydew and the sooty mold, that reduces the amount of sunlight a plant can capture, reduces the amount of photosynthesis and then reduces the yield. So from a farming perspective, Aphids are, are, can damage a plant just by their pure feeding, but can also damage um, from, uh, from the honeydew and reducing energy production. One of the more interesting things about this honeydew is that it promotes these facilitation with other species, this, this mutualism with ants. So here are some pictures of ants actually taking in and feeding the honeydew. The ants are almost like uh, 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 farmers in this respect, where they can treat the aphids like cows. The ants can take the honeydew, and in return, sometimes the ants can provide protection to the aphid colonies from predators. Um, and so this is a, a mutualism that has uh, evolved over millions and millions of years. And hopefully here's a video that might show this. I had some issues with this video as well, but a lot of these videos I'm, I um, have received or gotten from YouTube. So if you're interested in looking at uh, um, uh, ants, um, you can type into YouTube and see if this will work. Here's an example, apologize for the quality here, but this ant has an aphid and this aphid is going to produce the honeydew and the ant is has gotten the honeydew. Let's see if there's a good, there should be another picture coming up. So uh, the picture was a little grainy, um, but I'll stop here. And I've seen the I see that we have some questions in the chat here. Um, question I'm on: um, uh, How can we control aphids? Um, and we can we'll discuss that in a little bit on some control efforts and using some biological control um, to control aphids to to stop them from being so uh, uh, bad for our plants. Um, and hopefully, uh, aphids, studying aphids is important for many aspects of protecting uh, against plant injury, but also as biological models and understanding genetic and evolutionary processes, too. Um, so let's pause here and ask, see if there's any other questions about aphids. Okay, well, we'll. Uh, talk a little bit about natural control processes. We've talked about how aphids can be such a, a bad problem for farmers um, and even homeowners too. Um, but what what can we do um, to control them? How are aphids also import, important uh, ecologically and environmentally? So as you can as you might imagine, because aphids are everywhere. Um, any plant can probably have an aphid species. And if you have one aphid in a week, you'll have tens. And then a, a weeks after that, you'll have hundreds and thousands. Aphids are a prime food source for other organisms. Uh, and most of these other organisms are other predatory insects. One example is a lady beetle. Uh, lady beetles are one of the prime predators of aphids. You can actually purchase lady beetles from some supply stores, from gardening supply stores, um, and release them in the hopes that you can have them 
feed on the aphids that might be feeding on your home gardens. Some of you might have seen some of these in your gardens or uh, outside, and these are actually lady beetle larvae. So if you see these kind of dragon looking like uh, bugs, these are actually quite good because these are the lady beetle, the larvae of lady beetles, and they are also predaceous on uh, aphids. So lady beetles, both in the adult and in the larval stage, can feed on aphids. And that's one of the reasons why lady beetles are such good and important predators. Uh, ant lines are another type of predator. These have huge mouth parts, and we'll show a video of ant lines. Um, and they can feed uh, quite heavily on aphids, as well as other insects. There's a min minute pirate bug here. Again, these have long proboscis, a long mouth part that pierce an aphid. And instead of like an aphid sucking uh, the sugary phloem, the pirate bug is going to suck all the insides out of the aphid and kill the aphid. So it's very good from the minute pirate bug's perspective. And here we have surfid larvae. A uh, surfid is a type of fly. These are the flies that look like, sometimes look like uh, honeybees, but they're actually flies. Um, and in the larval stage, these maggots can be on plants and feed on a lot of aphids. And there's a good question here about um, aphids and pirate bugs. Uh, in, in, in an insect world, um, there's only certain types of insects that are scientifically known as bugs. And these are the ones that are in the Hemiptera group. Um, so stink bugs is an actual bug. Uh, a kissing bug is an actual bug. A cicada is an actual bug. Uh, and aphids are within that group. So you can technically call aphids bugs. So here's a video of this is an antlion larvae. And the antlion larvae is going to find this bird cherry oat aphid. Bird cherry oats aphids are um, pest of wheat. And you can see the big mouth parts here on the antlion and it's found this aphid and it's going to start uh, uh, eating this aphid. One interesting thing about aphids is you can see this droplet here, this red droplet. This is actually an alarm pheromone. It's not blood. Aphids don't have a blood like typically we have, but this is a little liquid coming out of what we call cornicles or these stovepipes. And this liquid is an alarm. It has a, a, a scent uh, that should warn other aphids that there's a predator here. What's interesting is this aphid isn't responding. It's either found something that's really, really gourd or maybe it's fallen asleep. But that's uh, what this alarm pheromone is. Here's an example of a surfid larvae. And here's another video. Again, these are larvae of flies. Um, so technically, they are known as maggots. Uh, Hoverfly is another name for surfid larvae. And they just kind of go along on um, a, a plant, a leaf, find an aphid. And they have uh, hooks for mouth parts. And they latch on to the aphid. And they just suck body fluids from the aphids. Here you can see um, two surfid larvae feeding on an aphid. And you can see here, um, here's the mouth parts to two hooks latching on an, to an aphid and just feeding the aphid here. One other example, uh, an important uh, aspect that aphids have for ecology is for parasitoid wasps. Parasitoid wasps are specialists and they are known to attack aphids. These wasps are very, very tiny. You can see they're about the size of an aphid. And these wasps are will not attack humans. These aren't the ty type of moths that will attack humans. Um, but what they do is they lay eggs here. They, they, they poke. It's almost like they're giving the aphid a shot. And they poke the adult aphid or sometimes the nymph's aphid here. And they lay an egg inside of the aphid. So here's another example of the, the sort of the stinger per se. And it deposits an egg inside the aphid. And that egg hatches and develops inside of the aphid. Here's an example of the developing uh, wasp larvae inside of the aphid. And then when the, uh, the wasp uh, uh, has completed its development and becomes an adult, it emerges from the aphid and it makes this nice little hole. And we call these aphid mummies because they look like they're wrapped, almost look like a mummy. Um, and what happened is that you had a parasitoid wasp that uh, survive, lives and survived inside an aphid. So if you see these on some of your plants, that's good because you have some natural control occurring, uh, uh, controlling your aphids. There's a time-lapse video of an adult 
uh, parasitoid wasp um, emerging from an aphid mummy. For some reason, my screen is a little out of whack, but here is an example. Okay, this video is not working, so we can move on. So here's another example um, of a video of a parasitoid wasp attacking the aphid. And what I'm gonna do here is, once this loads, fast forward. Here's a good spot. So here is a parasitoid wasp looking for an aphid, trying to find an aphid. It's found an aphid. And watch, it does some aerobatics or gymnastics. It kind of takes its abdomen, goes underneath, and pokes the aphid. You can watch it right here. It's going to go underneath. And you can see the aphid trying to fend it off, try to fight. And so here's another example. They're right there. It's just that simple little action right there deposits an egg right into the aphid. And then it's going to, uh, that aphid will have a parasitoid wasp living inside itself. Pretty gruesome from an insect point of view, but from a farmer's point of view, these parasitoid wasps are really good to help control aphid populations. So let's talk about aphids as crop pests. Um, like I said, there's 5,000 aphids, and more than likely, if you have a plant, there's an aphid species that is able to survive and potentially hurt that plant. There are what's known as rose aphids. I used to have these in my garden. Um, the Russian wheat aphid, and you can see here the aphid city that's on this wheat plant. These are very, these are actually very bad pests, especially out in the uh, central prairies of the U.S. Not only because they can grow to huge populations per wheat, but they are also known to transmit plant viruses, uh, which can really uh, harm the yield and quality of of wheat. There is a rosy apple aphids. Yes, even apples can get uh, aphids. These are particularly bad in Europe where there's a lot of spraying to control against uh, apple aphids and protect the fruit of, af of apples. There's corn leaf aphids. You can see here how, how bad a corn ear can get in the population of corn leaves. And one of the more interesting aphids is the soybean aphid. This happens to be a, a species that I study at Ohio State. Um, and it's sort of one of the more important insect pests for Ohio soybean production, as well as soybean production throughout the Midwest. But uh, you know, for a while, one of the advantages of soybean was that soybean really did not need any insecticide sprays to to um, against it. We had very minor pests, um, on and on rare occasion would these insect pests actually harm soybean. Um, since the soybean aphid arrived, this is this is an invasive pest arriving from Asia around the year 2000, we've seen a 130 fold increase in insecticide use on soybean. And you can see why, because some of these uh, soybean plants have tremendous amounts of aphid populations that can really harm uh, soybean yield and soybean production. So talking a little bit about the soybean aphid because it's such an important pest for soybean production in Ohio. Um, it's an invasive pest, and now it's found across the Midwest USA. All Wherever soybean is grown in the Midwest, more than likely you can find soybean aphids on it. And here's an example, too. This happens to be a soybean stem, and there's very hardly any space where you can add another aphid here. The population is so great. Uh, high populations can decrease soybean yield by 40%. There's about almost 4.5 million acres of soybean. And so if you have an infestation of soybean aphid, that's almost about almost 2 million acres of soybean completely gone just because of the soybean aphid. Most commonly used to control these are insecticides because the populations can rapidly increase um, and, and, and harm yield. Um, and But one of the things, one of the advantages, um, or one of the important things that we've been able to do at Ohio State and at other land grant universities um, across the Midwest is provide farmers with tools and recommendations on how to sustainably control aphids. Um, and this is through um, uh, checkoff organizations. These are organizations that the soybean farmers uh, provide support to, to, 
to fund this type of research, such as the Ohio Soybean Council and the North Central Soybean Research Program. And we develop tools and recommendations. So right here is an example of a pamphlet that uh, we've put together as entomologists across public universities to help growers. And what we have told growers is that you can have up to about 250 aphids per plant before you need to spray. Now, this is important because especially nowadays, most farmers will only see 10 aphids on a plant and that's okay. It's not gonna harm yield. So by telling, by advising growers and farmers to only spray when necessary, we reduce the load of insecticides as well as protect the yield in soybean production. So it's been a, a very uh, good uh, coordination and partnership between entomologists, soybean farmers and soybean organizations. One of the bad things that we found is that despite these good management practices, we do have resistance to insecticides in the soybean aphid, especially out west in Iowa and Minnesota. So one of the things that soybean farmers are co collaborating with uh, entomologists is to develop uh, soybean plants that have natural resistance to uh, the soybean aphid. Um, and these are not transgenic uh, uh, plants. These are natural resistant plants. And you can see here an example where this plant has a is naturally resistant to the soybean aphid, and this plant is not. And you can see the difference in control it can have. There's something in the aphids, whether it's uh, um, the aphids just don't like the taste or they don't like, they're not attracted to this plant. And this has been good because we're starting to, to to research these varieties and hopefully make these varieties available to farmers so that they can plant these and protect themselves um, against uh, soybean aphids. So with that, um, I hope that this was this presentation was all about aphids and that we've learned and, and I've hopefully convinced you that aphids are some of the more interesting insects. They have uh, certainly interesting uh, and, uh, and a diverse variety of life history characteristics and a diversity of, of life strategies. Um, and they are also uh, uh, important pests, especially on a lot of crops. Uh, crops that are important to Ohio and crops that are important to homeowners in the backyard. We have uh, uh, aphids in our garden uh, 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 that can uh, transmit a lot of disease and be very, very uh, injurious. But aphids are also an important part of ecological systems. Without aphids, we might not have lady beetles, and we all like lady beetles. Um, and aphids are important food source for many of the other predatory insects that can control not only aphids, but a lot of these adrenalists, and they can control a lot of other pests um, as well. So with that, I want to thank uh, COSI for hosting this event, the Center for Applied Plant Sciences, um, which is a, 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 an organization at The Ohio State University, um, to, uh, helping uh, and partner with this event, um, as well as The Ohio State University as well. Um, and with that, I think I can take any questions. And I do see a question here about um, my career and what my career path was to let led me study the aphids. Um, I was always interested in insects. Um, I uh, have a uh, undergraduate degree in entomology. Um, I studied mosquitoes for a while, but when I came to Ohio State uh, in 2007, um, I had experience in genetics and experience in insects. And at that time point, um, there was a lot of research that needed to be done with the soybean and soybean aphid. So uh, this is when I really started to get into aphids because it was an invasive pest. It was really hurting the soybean farmers. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to use my research experience, especially from genetics, especially from plant uh, insect management, and to be part of a team to help come up with some strategies to control uh, the soybean aphid and protect uh, against um, pr protect against damage from soybean and ensure you know the soybean production for Ohio soybean farmers and soybean farmers across the Midwest. And also, I think aphids. I never really studied aphids until I came to Ohio, Ohio State, and since then, I've realized how interesting uh, and exciting uh, aphids and diverse uh, aphids are. So another question here, talk about scientific studies that we've been part of or we find interesting. One of the things that that um, I've been really interested and in, glad to be part of was developing this uh, threshold for soybean aphids. 
um, as well as being part of trying to understand and develop these resistant varieties to get them into the hands of farmers. One of the other things that we've done in my lab, um, uh, again, with the help of soybean organizations, is that we, my lab was one of the first to completely sequence the genome of the soybean aphid. It was the third aphid uh, that was sequenced. The pea aphid was the first one. And then there was, I believe, the Russian wheat aphid. Um, and we ha we know almost 95% of every base pair of the soybean aphid. And this is good because this is now a resource that we can use to understand how soybean aphids uh, evolved resistance to insecticides. So we can look at gene targets that way um, and also understand more about the, the soybean aphid biology. Another question here is how much of your time is spent in a lab? Um, I have a lot of students that spend a lot of time in, in, in the lab. Um, and they do a lot of the lab work, but I spend about maybe 20 to 30 percent of my time in the lab um, uh, doing some genetics of aphids. We do a lot of bioassays with aphids. One of the things that I like to do, especially in the growing season, is to go across Ohio to soybean farms, talk to soybean farmers, and to go into soybean fields and look for soybean aphids. Part of my interest is capturing uh, the soybean aphid genetic diversity across Ohio. And driving around Ohio, getting that field work has been really interesting and important, uh, an important aspect of my research. So I'm not sure if there's any more questions. I do appreciate everybody's attention. Um, I can be reached for uh, uh, by email at michel.70 at osu.edu. Um, my specialty is soybean aphids, but I can try to help with any aphid issues that you're, you might see on your on your farms um, or in your in your backyard gardens. But the next time you see an aphid, um, watch it carefully because you might see its ability to clone, um, and hopefully you might have a new appreciation for aphids, even though they are pests and a lot of people don't like aphids. Um, they have very interesting life cycles and they can be an important part from ecology uh, and from an environmental standpoint. So with that, I thank you for your attention.